want to welcome everyone to this um, Zoom meeting on Julian Assange, Separating Fact from Fiction. We have our wonderful speakers all here, ready to go. And because John and Gabriel Shipton, uh, Julian's father and brother, uh, have very limited time, I'm just going to let them start and, uh, and then we can maybe backtrack and do a little bit of introductions. Um, our other panelists here today are John Kiriakou, Fidel uh, Navaez, and Ray McGovern. Welcome, John and Gabriel. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Thank you. It's a week ago. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you want, we'll just update you where we are. We're, we're, we're sort of, I think we're three stop, four stops into our 17 stop uh tour across across the us uh, we're in uh, washington um washington dc today and then tomorrow uh we're off to columbus ohio um you know it's been it's been pretty amazing the uh the turnouts that we've been getting um i guess you know whoever's been following it um can see there's really a sort of uh, momentum building uh, as we as we travel from from place to place um, you know, yeah. So the you know the media is paying more attention. We're getting you know it's just it's just really is it's just really incredible um, to see see the amount of support and momentum that is sort of coming together as 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 we uh, move forward. And yeah, can't wait to see what it's like towards the end when we we finish up in Washington D.C. on the thirtieth of June. So hopefully. Um, you know, I think we'll be coming maybe to visit you, Ray, after that with with a pair of scissors <laughs> uh, <laughs> to uh, <laughs> take take away your solidarity beard. I hope we hopefully we can take that back to Australia with us in a plat. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and to yeah, that would be nice. Well, um, and. Um... And John, I, I saw your and Gabriel's interview with uh, Amy Goodman in on Democracy Now, and, and that was wonderful. And you, you really provided all kinds of evidence for the effectiveness of WikiLeaks in, in providing justice for humanity. And um, do you want to add any comments about that here? Oh, it's just uh, um, with some just some amusing, uh, well, more or less amusing oddities. That uh, here we are, two Australians uh, wandering the the U.S. Uh, um, defending <laughs> defending the First Amendment <laughs> <laughs> and shaking our fist at the powers that be that this is a a civilizational goal that you guys have got and the rest of the world, well, in particular Australia, uh, I know, envies it and every election we have in Australia, we all shake our fists and say we want a First Amendment and we want we want a Bill of Rights. Um, and and uh, we, we are sort of saying that, you know, don't let it go. It's, uh, it's just the most valuable gold of civilization and a fine example to the rest of the world to have such a uh, amendment uh, to the constitution so that that's one thing the other thing is of of course uh, uh getting access to uh people who can influence i mean our, our meetings with uh, par parliamentarians and politicians are always private meetings we don't do uh, public meetings and in order to uh, build support and build trust. Also, um, we're also pointing out that we are uh, ordinary people, uh, uh, quite middle class, middle of the road, and our uh, affections, or Julian's affections, are, have always been uh, with the West, you know, uh, just uh, we like to see it behave uh, better. <laughs> behave yourself <laughs> <laughs> yes yeah, so that, that is a, in in general our approach as sorry that in general is what it has emerged as our approach in the in the united states wonderful wonderful um so uh 
do you find that American people need to have an education about who Julian is? I mean, do you, do you, do you have any anecdotes to relate in your conversations about <clears throat> maybe misconceptions Americans have about Julian? Oh, not really in the audiences so far. Um, the, the matter now is moving into its 13th year. So you can't expect in the deluge of change that's happened over the last 13 years, it would be unfair to expect the, the American people to be up to date on Julian Assange's matter when there's ceaseless change and uh, the grinding of geopolitical tectonic plates and and uh, climate change and those sort of concerns uh, overwhelming people's consciousness with uh, vast movements of, of uh, history. So it, it would be a little unfair. However, the, we've found the audiences willing, open, and in quite a few cases, erudite. Wonderful. How about you, Gabriel? What's yeah, I think it's always, uh, you know, it's always worth reminding people what, uh, you know, why Julian's charged, uh, you know, what the, for the work that he did. And I think that's something that, that we uh, commonly do, you know, as part of the, as part of the panels and things that, that we're doing is, you know, reminding everyone, you know, that, that the, of the work WikiLeaks did and exactly what Julian is charged for. Um, so I think, you know, that's part and part of, part of why we're here is, is just to sort of, you know, bring that all up again and, and just help people remember, um, you know, the work that, that Julian did. A derivative of uh, what we do is also to point out the value of what, what are called leaks, but uh, I like to call them revelations of uh, government behaviour. These, you know, John Kuriaku, uh, Chelsea Manning, many others uh, have brought us knowledge. And with that knowledge, we can participate in our government and, or, and uh, modify the government's approach uh, and also to contribute to the formulation of policy. These are really important things, vital things that... Uh, that the leaks provide to us. Um, without the leaks and without a vigorous press, uh, the the government uh, in its the governments tend to be a little bit blind because they're self concerned and in its blindness, wander off the track uh, and embark upon wars. Uh, uh, well, I, I don't need to rest it. I think there's seven or eight of them over the last twenty years, and bring about the reduction of the capacity to the United States to care for its own people because of the <laughs> squandering of trillions of dollars on these. Uh, Stupid wash. Yeah, yeah. So, but, so really uh, two things. First of all is the free press, the, the grandeur of the Second Amendment and the beauty of feeding into those uh, structures, the, the leaks from... Uh, Chelsea and John and many others who have contributed to our understanding of the world. Well, that's very profound. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. And were both of you at the extradition trial? I know you were there, John, uh, sitting in, you know, with the family seating. Can you, Gabriel, were you there as well? I was there, but I wasn't there for the whole time. I was there for the, for the final day. I see. I yeah. see. So uh, would either of you like to tell us some of your firsthand experience uh, sitting in, in that trial and watching what was going on in, in Judge Baratzer's court? Yeah, I, I just uh, can add one thing, uh, which is fairly important, is that the, the rules require each side to be equally armed, so the defence equally armed to the, the prosecution. And that way, somehow or other, the truth will emerge and the judge can make a proper decision. And Julian's, in the prosecution circumstances, these instructing solicitors from the Department of Justice sat alongside the prosecutor, James. In Julian's circumstance, he was in a glass box up the back. 
Yes. For ter- Sorry? For terrorists. And the, the, the gliss glass box had a raised floor and also the, a slot about 30, about an inch and a half wide now and again. So in order to instruct his solicitor and his barristers, Julian had to sit on his knees and put his lips to this slot. And on the other side, as a consequence of the raised floor, the, the solicitor had to stand on a tip's toes and put an ear to the slot. Any instructions were thereby heard by the prosecutor and the prosecutor's instructing staff. Uh, that describes one of the circumstances. A bail application was put, the, sorry, an application was put to the judge to move Julian into the body of the court. And the judge, in her wisdom, said, oh, this will require a bail application. So a legal argument ensued over whether it required a bail application to remove, <laughs> to move Julian from the circumstance where he couldn't hear, couldn't instruct his solicitors into the body of the court uh, to be able to sit there uh, alongside the barristers. Now that just illustrates to you the quality of a, I guess you'd say a, a show trial. Yeah. Craig Murray, uh, who is a, a diarist and historian, right, sitting alongside us, said that the quality of it, it was a manifestation of evil intent. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Hmm. So um, it seemed that, you know, there were so many aspects of that trial that were very Kafkaesque and Americans got, you know, information from Computer Weekly. I think Computer Weekly was our savior and actually published, you know, uh, publishing information beyond, as Glenn Greenwald said, uh, Kevin Gostela and, and some bloggers. And of course, Craig's literary epistles daily were wonderful, absolutely wonderful. Uh, Gabriel or John, do, does either of you want to talk any more about, you know, kind of the, the cock? I mean, it was just such an amazing trial. Uh, are there parts of it that stuck out for you that you would like to relate to the people here? Um, I think, you know, when uh, there was the testimony from a, uh, as part of the trial, uh, they they were condensing all the witness uh, statements into written statements. So, you know, as part of, uh, you know, that was sort of an, an effort to sort of stop having the witnesses appear and read out their statements and sort of, you know, therefore like squash the reporting on the witness statements. Um, so they went through, all, you know, a bunch of witness. Uh, so all the witness statements were, were all being submitted and agreed in writing uh, towards the end of the trial. Um, one, uh, I think one, you know, um, um, incredible moment was the, there was a, uh, you know, a torture victim. I can't recall his name at the moment, but. Um, El Masri? Yeah. And, and Julian, you know, they were they wanted the court. Uh, they were having some computer issues and some te- technical issues, and the court uh, uh, wanted to have his statement um, changed to a written statement. And Julian um, spoke up in the court and said that he would not, um, you know, he would not sit by uh, the silencing, of, you know, of a torture victim. I think that was really showed, uh, you know, what this trial was all about uh, in in that one moment. Is that, um, you know, Julian standing up standing up for for against injustice right and um do you recall the testimony of dean yates or was that in person or was that submitted as written testimony submitted as written yes yeah, yeah. um, dean has uh, uh written a book uh, with a, a considerable amount of that book uh, uh, on the uh collateral murder video and the circumstances of dispatching the Reuters um, journalists to their death. It'll be out this week. Yeah. Yeah, that was, uh, that was something actually that Computer Weekly covered, uh, I think, prior to the trial. Um, you know, given that you only have about four minutes left with us, um, 
I'm going to see, are there people in the call who would like to ask a question? And um, I, I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, yeah, I see Jim from Milwaukee has raised his hand. Let me see if I can unmute him. Uh, yeah, I'm going to ask. Unmute. There. Oh, Jim, Jim Carpenter, wonderful activist in uh, oh, Peace Action. Yes, uh, thank you for visiting our, our city. Uh, um, I just wanted to know if you um, have thought about the parallel between what Julian has done and what the uh, person who videotaped uh, the George Floyd murder did and how we um, <clears throat> celebrate uh, the videotaping of George Floyd, but are prosecuting uh, a, a, a Julian for doing basically the same thing. No, I haven't uh, until this moment uh, given it any uh, thought. And also um, the circumstances, the social circumstances in the United States since the Trump administration have changed so much that it's uh, illegible to us to make those sort of uh, parallels. You know, Julian's circumstances was to bring to us the means whereby we can evaluate and analyze government actions based upon the leaks that were provided to, to Julian by uh, Chelsea Manning and others. This is really important because that ledger, that library is still available to us to enable us to go and do further research. Um, uh, that, uh, the, not so long ago in Canberra, which is the capital of Australia, I had uh, lunch with a retired uh, diplomat uh, who <laughs> revealed to me that uh, occasionally, or on occasion rather, on occasion, they use WikiLeaks, a uh, library of cables themselves, <laughs> to bring themselves up to date and evaluate where they stand in a particular issue. So you can see from that description I've given you that it's a, a, a profound understanding of the internet, of the capacity to do searches, of the capacity for the mass of us to contribute to analysis and in forums privately at home or on the internet to bring forth an understanding of what is being done and how and suggest to each other how to go about changing things. Thank you. Thank you. So do you know if Julian is getting his mail? Someone in chat has asked that question. Let me see, that's Carolyn. Someone named Carolyn in chat has asked that question. And I see we uh, James has a hand raised. Uh, yeah, he so should be getting his mail if you do if you follow the instructions on writejulian.com. Yeah. He is he is getting a mail and writejulian.com is a, a great way of uh, the thing with being in jail by yourself for a year on end, having contact with the outside strengthens the heart because the aim of that sort of jailing system is to separate you from your society and consequently re-educate uh, re you in, into uh, another circumstances because, you know, human organisms respond to their, to their immediate circumstance. So having the heart to go on and having the circumstance of people on the outside, strangers writing to you and saying, you know, uh, good on you and so on, is just strengthening, really strengthening. Wonderful. So I think someone named James has his hand raised. Yes. Uh, thank uh, you. You're unmuted. Yes, thank you. Good. And thank you for, for, for being, uh, being here and uh, John and Ray, who I have met numerous times. I'm actually in Cambridge. I apologize for my image. I can't really figure out how to <laughs> replace it. It's a, a local battle over that has some, an environmental dimension to it here in, in North Cambridge, actually. Um, so I have two questions. One is, and thank you again for, for doing this and for being here. And I missed you at the Community Church of Boston uh, where you were awarded the Sacco and Vanzetti Award. Um, um, the first is, um, if you're 
able to talk about any uh, contact you may have or may be anticipating with American elected officials. I, I know you said you're, you're, you're not entirely comfortable talking about it in any detail, but is there anything you can say about anybody you have been in touch with, any support that uh, is being expressed by any elected officials in the United States and what, if anything, any of them are doing or, or say they're going to do. And the other question is it's sort of a, it's kind of, it's the question that really occurs to me more than any other. I think there may be some sensitivity around it. Um, so I want to acknowledge that. I think a lot of damage was done to Julian by the early accusations, allegations around which he was first detained. And I think it's something that government do to smear people. It, it's the, one of the easiest ways to smear someone's reputation is with allegations of sexual misconduct of one sort or another. It's what was used against Scott Ritter, if uh, many of you remember that. Um, to take down somebody who's telling important truths about uh, very important issues and like bring out something, either an allegation or whatever it may be. So I wonder if you might be willing to speak a little about the impact of that and how that has been um, put to rest, how it ended up being, um, those charges ended up being dropped, if you could speak to that at all. Because I think it's something that they weren't charges. There, there, there was no charges, just allegations. So, allegations. Right? Yeah, yeah. Um, it I think ends up you want to talk about. Like quick, we, we've got to jump off, but we can quickly talk about. Oh, okay. Um, sorry. Yeah, yeah. So Gar Merrick Garland, um, Merrick Garland today has um, will next week is going to meet with the New York Times, Washington Post, and the CNN to discuss. Uh, you know what they're calling Trump era attacks on journalism from the DOJ. So that that's. Um, you know, one very interesting point uh, that, that's going on here at the moment. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to we're trying to you know call out to the New York Times and the Washington Post, encouraging people to get in on their comments section, saying that they should be raising Julian's case uh, because you know it's the biggest press freedom case uh, you know in the last fifty years. So so you know it should be it should be part of the that conversation. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to say I hope to meet John Kiriakou and uh, uh, um, dear friend Fidel there uh, soon and Ray. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank yeah. you. Thank you both so much for being with us. We appreciate your taking the time. And and I understand you have a, an event at five o'clock in D.C. At yes. Yeah. Busboys and Poets. Uh, Ryan Grimm's joining us. Uh, Marianne Williamson. And Chip Gibbons. So you're really looking forward to that. Another, I mean, you know, it's just crazy. Everywhere we go, we're having these um, great turnouts. Um, uh, you know, who would have thought that that um, this this would have been possible a couple of months ago? But here we are. Well, we're really yeah. looking forward to your visit to Milwaukee on yeah, June great. 19th. We are too. Uh, an outdoor uh, event rally for people to come and speak with you. Um, at the just north of the Sunburst uh, sculpture in Milwaukee on Wisconsin Avenue. So anyway, we look forward to actually meeting you in person. Thank you and so your much host, for being your here. Your host at Bus Boys and Poets is the great Andy Shalal, a wonderful yeah. restaurateur no, no, he's in Washington, great, Andy. D.C. Oh. He's a wonderful right. guy. Thanks. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Ciao, ciao. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Um, I put an article in the chat um, with uh, from Niels, the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture, Niels Meltzer, called uh, Demasking the Torture of Julian Assange. And uh, I think that one addresses the um, sexual allegations and uh, the nine years of an investigation that never rose above an investigation and allegations never charges. Um, Thank you, Anne. And if someone could put in the uh, the Republic, I was actually looking for the Republic uh, article. I, th I think people here may know that. I'll I'll look for it later as well. Okay. Well, and, and uh, may I add one thing about the sexual allegations? Absolutely. Please and just jump in. I I think that this is a well thought out strategy on the part of the Justice Department, uh, and it's because they've seen over the years that people 
have tended to rally around those accused of, uh, of making whistleblower revelations. You know, you look at people like, um, like Matt DeHart, for example, or the, the Vault 7 uh, whistleblower, or Scott Ritter. They, they, the Justice Department will throw these accusations of sexual um, impropriety, sometimes even involving children. And immediately supporters walk away because no one wants to support a pedophile or a rapist or a, a sex predator. Right. And then they never offer up any kind of proof or evidence that any such crime ever occurred. Right. Well, by the time they're called to account, which happens, uh, the, the whole case has been wrecked from the, from the perspective of the accused. His supporters have walked away from him. And then there's this this whiff still of impropriety. It's uh, this is an insidious uh, thing right. that the Justice Department does, and uh, we all have to stand up to it. Is it just the Justice Department? Do you think aid? You know, like I have CIA. We, my NSA? my guess is that it comes from CIA, from NSA, from FBI. Sure. Right. Thanks. Yeah, it's an imprint. It's an imprint. It's hard to shake once that imprint is there from the very first encounter that many people have with a, with a public personality. I think most people don't ever read the WikiLeaks as good and important as they are. Agreed. Most people don't ever read that stuff. They just see a cursory media report about it. But what, what's, what grabs a lot of people more are salacious stories mm -hmm. uh, about uh, personalities. Yeah. And that's what sticks in people's heads. And I think, I think we, if we want to support Julian and the work of people like Julian, we have to we have to find ways of reckoning with that. And so That's I appreciate right. Pamela and placing some things in the chat and really appreciate your speaking to it, John, because oh, I think you. it's 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 how they took down Scott Ritter. And in his case, you're exactly there may have right. Been some evidence of something. But, man, they took him out. You know, uh, you know, the story anyway. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Matt DeHart is the same way, and I'll keep this very short. Matt DeHart was accused of, of having child pornography on his computer, and he denied and denied and denied and finally was granted a hearing on the contents of the computer. And not only was there no child pornography, there was no pornography, period, of any kind. Uh, there was nothing sexual of any kind. The judge told the Justice Department they should be ashamed of themselves. And they just said, oh, well, we're sorry. It was an administrative error of, of some yeah. sort. Well, yeah. Matt DeHart was already <laughs> ruined by that point. Yeah. And yeah. you can't recover from something like that. Yeah. Thank you. So, thank, you. Um, I, I'm, uh, thank you very much for that discussion. I think perhaps we should uh, hear now from Fidel Narvaez, who... Uh, whose tour as consul and I think secretariat at one point in the Ecuadorian embassy overlapped uh, Julian's. In fact, he helped, I think, to Julian to get uh, asylum in the Ecuadorian embassy. Um, it overlapped until July of 2018 when Lennon Moreno was de uh, determined to remove anyone who was friendly toward Julian from the Ecuadorian embassy in London. Uh, Fidel? Do you want to take it from here and, um, you know, sure. Let, sure. Us, let us know. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, everybody, for uh, gathering together to support uh, uh, Julian. Uh, let me take it from exactly the point we were um, talking uh, before uh, you gave me the, the floor, which is the, the, the Swedish case. Why do I do that? Because according to the title of the session, uh, this we need to separate separate facts from fiction, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, if Julian spent so many years, seven years, uh, and uh, under the political asylum protection of Ecuador, uh, it was not related to Sweden at all. Many people withdraw the the support uh, they uh, had for Julian precisely because they said, well, uh, if somebody has been charged with rape, they need to face the music. And that's, uh, 
th that uh, going and hiding an embassy is not something that we can support. From the day one, political asylum was granted regarding the political persecution from the United States regarding journalistic activities of Julian Assange. Nothing to do with uh, Sweden. But the UK from day one also said that there is no political persecution. There's nothing to do with journalistic activities. That the only reason why they have surrendered the embassy, they have launched a huge, huge siege uh, operation that lasted seven years, basically, was the request from Sweden. So uh, that case, as it was mentioned here, uh, never got charges. It was always a preliminary investigation. That case was open and closed several times. And it is not true that uh, the case expired while Julian was in the embassy. The Swedish, in fact, came finally after five years of, of uh, diplomatic dispute with Ecuador, they finally came and interviewed Julian in the embassy. Of course, they didn't have anything to bring charges and they closed the case. The UK, that always said that it was a Swedish case, when the case was closed, then said, oh, okay, this is not about political persecution. This is not about journalistic activities. This is about jumping bail. Jumping bail for a case that was closed. So another thing that we need to realize is that no country will launch such a manhunt that cost millions, millions of pounds to, to surveil the embassy, to spy on the embassy. Uh, and the UK even threatened with storming the embassy for a man who jumped a bail. Yeah. Yeah. Jumping a bail is not even a crime right. in the UK. It's something that many people do and you get either a fine or you get a couple of weeks in prison for doing that or you get uh, community services. So that's regarding the Swedish case. Um, it's also not true that Julian Assange had some kind of agreement hidden agreement with the Ecuadorian government in, in exchange of political asylum. His case was always about human rights. There was not anything else on the table, like many people speculate. Julian Assange uh, maybe knew something about the government that the government didn't want to be uh, published, and that's why he was protecting Julian. It was never, never the case. And it was not the case that Julian Assange stayed in the embassy was some, some kind turbulent or wild, and that Julian was some kind ungrateful uh, and rude and, and clean. All that is fiction, fiction. I was there for six years and True to be said, we need to differentiate two periods during those seven years of Julian in the embassy. The first five years under the government who granted asylum when he was truly protected, always under difficult conditions, a small apartment, uh, siege by the police and everything. But it was a respectful relationship from him towards us, from us towards him we were protecting him, he was able to work, he was able to publish, he was able to have visitors. And then the second period, especially the last year, under the new government of Lenin, Lenin Moreno, uh, when everything changed, obviously protection stopped, 
it was obvious that the, 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 the new government was uh, um, surrendering under the pressure of the United States. And all of these allegations of uh, misbehavior, of violence, of uh, even uncleanness is, is made up in order to try to justify what they finally did, which handing Julian over to its uh, persecutors. So um, basically, um, I will start with that and give the floor to somebody else. And I'm happy to, to answer any, any questions you might have. So um, before you go, Fidel, uh, before your time, I'm, I, I, I want to actually ask you another uh, question about the UC Global uh, surveillance. If you could eliminate people, and I, I will be looking, uh, Tom is feeding me the chat questions, and I will be looking at that so that we can answer the questions in the chat. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yes. Listen, uh, before Julian arrived to the embassy. You're kind of, uh, your, your sound is uh, fading out a little. I will get closer, closer to the computer. Uh, before Julian arrived, to our embassy in 2012, the embassy did not have any security uh, guards even, no security cameras, no anything. Uh, having Julian inside 24 hours, seven days a week, we needed to have uh, uh, security. So what the Ecuador government did is to uh, contract a private security company, an European private security company that could work in the UK. And I don't know how they came up with uh, UC Global. That was not the embassy doing the, the contract. It was always coming from, from Quito. And uh, Julian was never happy with uh, the company. And many of us, the diplomats inside, were not feeling uh, uh, happy with, with, with the company. We always thought that was quite unprofessional, that was very invasive, but we didn't know, we didn't know that in fact they had a hidden agenda. We didn't know that they will end up at some point, they started to spy for third parties. Most likely, most likely, because all of this is already under investigation in Spain, uh, for the United States, for the intelligence agencies in the United States. So um, the company produced daily reports about Julian, about his visitors, about what was happening in the embassy. Those reports were directed directly to uh, Quito. The embassy didn't even know about them. And they were the base for later accusing Julian of uh, being violent, rude, and having misbehavior. They were obviously uh, made up allegations by the company in order to secure the employment, <laughs> uh, basically a corrupt company. Yeah. Uh, at the moment, the Spanish investigation has not finished yet, but the man in charge of UC Global uh, is under uh, home arrest. And I think there's no other outcome from that. I am part of the, of the, of the, of the investigation. I am a uh, witness and victim. Uh, in, in that case, uh, he's going to be sentenced for, for spying. There's no, no, there's no other outcome on, on that one. Let's hope not. Thank you. I, I, if you would like to um, launch into your remarks sure. uh, during this ex exploration, I would appreciate it. My pleasure. Uh, I'm, I'm going to keep it short, and I'm also going to apologize in advance for repeating myself. Uh, I've I've spoken about this issue, wow, at least a half a dozen times, but you know, I, I think it's so important that it bears uh, repeating 
So Julian has been charged in the uh, Eastern District of Virginia, the federal court in the Eastern District of Virginia. Uh, that's where I was charged. That's where Jeffrey Sterling was charged. That's where Ed Snowden has been charged. It's where Daniel Hale is charged. And they call the Eastern District of Virginia the espionage court for a couple of reasons. One, uh, it's where the CIA is based, of course, and the Pentagon. And two, because no national security has ever won, oh, sorry, national security defendant has ever won a case there, ever. Uh, one of the reasons why the Justice Department seeks to charge people in the Eastern District is because they're virtually guaranteed a conviction. But beyond that, they're also guaranteed uh, a long sentence, right? This is the national security court. It's the most popular venue for national security cases. They do something called, well, there are two things called, uh, one is, is venue shopping, in which case they charge you in the Eastern District, unless you're one of the swells, like former CIA director, David Petraeus. Um, he was accused of leaking classified information, including the identities of 10 covert CIA operatives to his adulterous girlfriend. But he was not charged in the Eastern District of Virginia. He was charged in the Western District of North Carolina. And when he was finally um, sentenced to 18 months of unsupervised probation. Wow, they really threw the book at him. Yeah, then the judge came down from the bench to shake his hand and to thank him for his service to the country. You can bet your bottom dollar, Julian's not gonna be thanked for his service to anybody. So Eastern District of Virginia, uh, they're going to, in the event that Julian is extradited to the United States, and I, I both hope and pray that he is not, uh, they would, they would carry out this uh, this trial uh, as a as a national security trial under something called the SIPA Act, the Classified Information Protection Act. Uh, this is one of the most ridiculous, one of the most preposterous acts related to to trials that you can imagine. Uh, in my case, SIPA was invoked. And what that means is there are some words, individual words that the Justice Department will argue uh, should remain classified. So just for sake of argument, let's say the word CIA is classified or, or the acronym CIA is classified. In court, you're not allowed to say CIA you have to replace it with a word that the Justice Department gives you, let's say swimming pool, right? I'm totally serious. And so in a sentence, if you're speaking or your attorney is speaking, he has to say, Mr. Kiriakou worked at the swimming pool for 15 years before resigning from the swimming pool. And, and then the, the jury is given this list of words and word replacements, and they have to constantly refer back to the list to see what stupid word can't be uttered. Another thing they do, and I thought this was really overkill, is in one of my hearings where they had invoked SIPA, uh, they made everybody leave the courtroom, except of course the judge, the clerk, the bailiff, the prosecutors, the defense attorneys, and me. Everybody else was expelled. And then it took them an hour to unwrap plastic sheeting and with duct tape to cover the windows and the doors with the plastic sheeting so that the Russians couldn't shoot a laser beam at the window to detect the vibrations to hear what it was that we were saying. I can tell you what we were saying. We were saying that we needed a two week delay because we hadn't yet received discovery from the Justice Department. But this is what they're gonna do. Now the point isn't really to prevent the Russians from shooting the laser beam at the window because the Russians don't give a shit about the, you know, the, the hearing. <laughs> it's to intimidate the jury and to make them think, my God, if the Justice Department is willing to go to these lengths 
to protect this information, then he must be guilty, right? Otherwise, why would they spend tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars in the American taxpayer's money to protect the information? This must be a really bad guy. That's what they do. I'll give you another example of what they do in the Eastern District of Virginia. And this is something that, again, in the event that Julian is extradited here, he's going to have to deal with. And that is the inability to see or to speak with your attorneys. I had 11 attorneys in my case. And I mean, a list, you know, the, the best and in some cases, most famous attorneys in Washington, DC. I was not permitted to meet with them in their offices. Why? Because I might say something that was classified. And even though I was cleared for the information and they were cleared for the information, their office was not tempested. And so the Russians could shoot a laser beam at the window and hear the vibration of what we were saying in the office. And so you can't meet with them in the office. Where can you meet with them? In the Justice Department's classified conference room. Now, can you imagine the only place that you can talk to your defense attorney is in the enemy camp's conference room? And they'll say, well, we promise we're not spying on you. Okay, I'm supposed to believe that. But that's what we had to do. Now, in the case of Jeffrey Sterling, um, Jeffrey was staying with people in Reston, Virginia during his case. Uh, his attorney, Ed McMahon, was in Warrenton, Virginia, which is quite far away. It's about an hour's drive. And the courthouse is in Alexandria, Virginia. So what the Justice Department did is they took a, a supply closet at the courthouse and they spent $150,000 to make it soundproof so Jeffrey and his attorney could go into the supply closet and have a classified conversation. All right, that sounds great. But in my case, I had more than 50,000 pages of classified documents we needed to go through. Jeffrey had more. I was charged with five felonies. Jeffrey was charged with nine he had even more classified information he had to go through uh, thanks to discovery. You can't do that in a, in a broom closet. And so what they do is they make it as hard as they possibly can for you to get a fair trial. You're exhausted, you're cut off, you're depressed. In the case of Julian, he's going to be incarcerated. I mean, look at poor Daniel Hale right now. Daniel Hale uh, was out on bail, meeting with his attorneys, preparing for his own defense. And then the Justice Department said, you know what? He's depressed. And because he's depressed, he's probably suicidal. So in order to save him, we should lock him up in solitary confinement indefinitely. And that way he won't be able to kill himself. Well, he called me after about a week in solitary confinement. And he said, I wasn't suicidal. I am now. <laughs> Can you explain to people who uh, David? Yes. Hale Daniel Hale is a, oh, Daniel, is a I'm sorry. courageous young whistleblower who went to the intercept and blew the whistle on the uh, U.S. military's use of drones in the murder of civilians. And um, when I say courageous, I mean, he, he said, consequences be damned, this is a crime, I'm gonna report it. And, and he went public and, and just took those consequences. It's, it's funny, Daniel, Daniel is one of those very typical whistleblowers in that he doesn't consider himself to be a whistleblower. And he doesn't think that he did anything that was particularly brave. Um, and, and he's a young guy, he's with 30, 31 years old, he looks like he's 18. And I look up to this guy because he's so brave. And he's another one that's, you know, just facing the, the wrath of the Justice Department in the Eastern District. And, um, and he says, bring it on. Well, those of us who have gone through it have these stories. With the exception of Daniel, 
uh, we didn't have to defend ourselves from, from a cage in, in the federal detention center. And with the way everybody has overreacted uh, to Julian, purposely, of course, I can't even imagine what it would be like to uh, have to defend myself uh, while incarcerated, where you're not allowed to meet with your attorneys, you're not allowed to have classified conversations, your phone calls are monitored, your visitors are monitored, your incoming and outgoing mail is both monitored. That's not justice. That's not what the system was set up to be. And so, you know, my bottom line is and has always been that it is just simply not possible for Julian to receive anything akin to a fair trial in the Eastern District of Virginia. Uh, I'll add one other little short anecdote. Um, as you might imagine, I was, I was desperate as I was approaching trial. You know, when, when you're looking at 45 years or in the case of Dan Ellsberg, 100 years, you, you consider some extreme um, actions. And so a friend of mine is married to a woman whose uncle was O.J. Simpson's jury consultant, okay? Not just O.J. Simpson, but William Kennedy Smith and George Zimmerman and, you know, the biggest criminal cases in America in the last 25 years, he's been the jury consultant and he never, ever loses. So my friend called him and said, hey, I've got this friend. He's in big trouble in the Eastern District of Virginia. Uh, do you mind um, helping out? And I didn't have any money. And I mean, we were on food stamps. That's how little money that I, I had. So he did it as a favor. And he flew up to Washington uh, from Texas. And we got him a top secret security clearance as part of my legal team. And he went through all of the documents. We ended up using 15,000 pages of classified documents in my defense. And then we had a meeting with all the attorneys around the Justice Department's conference room table in their classified conference room. And he said to me, if we were in any other district in America, I would say, let's go for it. We're gonna win this thing. But the Eastern District of Virginia, he said, you don't have a prayer. Your jury is gonna be made up of people who either work for or have relatives who work for the CIA, the uh, Defense Department, the FBI, intelligence community contractors. He said, you don't have a chance. If I were you, I would take the deal. And I slaved over that decision for a long time. And then finally the Justice Department came back with what they called their best and final offer. And uh, it was for two and a half years in prison. My wife and I stayed up all night long, literally all night long, uh, trying to come to a final decision. And there was no case law we could refer to because I had been charged with violating the Intelligence Identities Protection Act of 1981, and no one had ever gone to trial. Only one other person was ever accused of that. And she was a spy for a foreign government. So I decided I didn't do anything wrong. I'm not pleading guilty. I'm going to go to trial. Naively thinking that once I get in front of a jury, they'll realize how ridiculous these charges are and I'll be found not guilty. So I emailed my attorneys at six o'clock in the morning and I told them this. We've been up all night I'm going to I'm going to turn the deal down. I want to go to trial. One of them wrote back immediately. He was the oldest, the most senior and arguably the most famous of the attorneys and he said to me, "You stupid son of a bitch, take the deal." That's all he said in the email. Another attorney wrote and said, "Put on a pot of coffee. We're coming over to the house." So around 7 o'clock in the morning, this was a Saturday morning, uh, they arrived at the house. And the attorney that who I liked and trusted the most, who was kind of the, the toughest and the meanest of the group, pulled me aside and he said, this can be a blip in your life or it can be the defining event of your life. 
let it be the blip. He said, if you were my brother, I would beg you to take this deal. You will never get a fair trial in the Eastern District of Virginia. And so I took the deal. You know, that's a decision really that nobody should have to make. We should all be confident that we'll get a fair trial. This is the United States of America. We're supposed to be the greatest country in the, in the world. We're supposed to be a country uh, uh, uh. founded on, yeah, exactly, founded on the rule of law and transparency and honesty and all that other nonsense that we're taught in, in school. And that's just not the case. And that's why Julian, if he is forced to come here, cannot possibly receive a fair trial. No part of it will be fair. The John, deck is stacked. Thank you so much. Could you briefly explain uh, the precipitating event for all of this in your case? Yeah, sure. Um, in 2002, January of 2002, I was named uh, uh, chief of the CIA's uh, counterterrorism operations in Pakistan. It was a big job immediately after 9-11. And in that capacity, I led a series of raids on March 22nd, 2002, that resulted in the capture of dozens and dozens of Al-Qaeda fighters, including several leaders. One was Abu Zubaydah, who we thought was the number three in Al-Qaeda at the time. He wasn't, but we, we captured him. He was sort of their safe house keeper, their logistics guy. And we captured several of their um, camp commanders. And, uh, you know, I, I sat with Abu Zubaydah. He, he had been severely wounded during the capture. A Pakistani policeman shot him three times with an AK-47. And so I sat at his bedside literally for 56 consecutive hours. I was ordered not to leave his bedside. And, um, and I urged him to cooperate. I told him, I am the nicest guy that you are going to meet in this experience. My colleagues are not nice like I am. So if there's one thing you do, it's that you have to cooperate. And he said, you seem like a nice man, but you're the enemy and I'll never cooperate. So, you know, eventually we, we carried him out uh, to a, an unmarked uh, jet and loaded him onto the, onto the luggage rack in the back and tied him down and he squeezed my hand. He was very upset. He was crying. He had no idea where he was going to go. And I whispered to him, remember, you have to cooperate. And, uh, and he took off. Well, that was, that was March 26th, 2002. On August 1st, the CIA began torturing him and they tortured him mercilessly. You know, there were, there were very clear rules about how to carry out these torture techniques. The rules were disregarded immediately. And so, um, he was tortured to the point where, where his heart stopped beating and he was revived only so he could be tortured more. And he was the guinea pig with which the CIA practiced torture techniques that they could then use against other prisoners that we were subsequently catching, mostly around Pakistan. And, uh, you know, I'm reading these cables coming back to headquarters from the site of a secret prison and, uh, and I'm, I'm thinking to myself, this is wrong, wrong, wrong. It's illegal, first of all. It's immoral. It's unethical. Somebody has to say something. And I just assumed somebody would. I waited and waited and waited. Nobody said anything. Finally, I resigned from the CIA two years later, still waiting for somebody to say something. To make a long story short, finally in December of 2007, I decided to say something. And so I gave a nationally televised interview on ABC News with Brian Ross, in which I said that the CIA was torturing its prisoners. I said that torture was official US government policy. It was not the result of a rogue CIA officer that President Bush had said. And I said that the torture policy had been personally approved by the president himself. Uh, within 24 hours, the CIA had filed a, what's called a crimes report against me with the, with the Justice Department, and the FBI began investigating me. But they investigated me for a year, from December of 07 to December of 08, and then they sent my attorney a declination letter declining to prosecute me because they said that they had concluded that I hadn't uh, violated the law. 
Uh, three weeks later, Barack Obama became president and he named John Brennan as his deputy national security advisor. John and I have always hated each other. And I've been very public about that. He was in over his head intellectually. Uh, and he was, uh, he was a, a torture apologist, quite simply. I had no idea that John asked this, the Justice Department to secretly reopen the case against me. And so for the next three years, my phone uh, was tapped, my emails were intercepted, and teams of FBI agents uh, surveilled my, my family and me. Three years, and finally in January of 2012, I was arrested and charged with five felonies, including three counts of espionage uh, coming out of that ABC News interview. Thank you very much, John. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, ask Ray to uh, speak. Uh, we're, we're at about 2.08. And um, um, Ray, uh, you can get your comments in. And then I think we uh, may have just a few minutes for question. But thank you so much, John. Your story is so compelling. And I want to get your book, How to Survive Prison Like a Spy. I haven't, I've, I've, it's on my list. I haven't gotten it Thank yet. you. I, I'll, I'll, I'll say that I'm, of all the books I've written, I'm the most proud of that one. But my wife told me that I make myself look like a real asshole. So be warned. Uh, another reason to read it. Ex-wife. Okay. My ex-wife says. Oh, boy. <laughs> Ray. Uh, Ray, would you like for me to share my screen and bring up your slides? Sure. Uh, let me uh, suggest that we try to put a little human face on Julian, uh, the people he loves most, and uh, what's happened to him and what happened to them. Um, if we show the first slide there. I think it, uh, it shows uh, Julian in happier days. Yep. Uh, there we are. Uh, this was eight years ago. Uh, these are Sam Adams Associates for integrity and intelligence from left to right. Anne Rice, Julian, myself, uh, Elizabeth Murray, and Colleen Rowley. Uh, we were visiting Julian. He put on a big spread for us. It was a, a glorious occasion. We were there to honor yet another recipient of the Sam Adams Award. Next, next slide, please. Now, no American, very few Americans have seen this. Uh, this is Julian with uh, little Gabriel. Now, we saw big Gabriel before. Uh, it's uh, no secret that little Gabriel is named after Julian's brother. And that's shortly after he was born. And of course, they're still in the Ecuadorian embassy. Next slide, please. There's Gabriel and Stella. Um, and there is little uh, Max. Uh, Max is uh, the, the youngest. Uh, you can tell that they're uh, very close and uh, I imagine they're very much missing their father and their husband or their uh, fiance. Next slide, please. Now this is my favorite. Uh, there's Gabriel uh, with a look on his face, you know, and, and we Irish would say, well, he, he's, he's the spit of his father. Uh, he, He's a spitting image of his father. Look at him there. And what is he saying? He says, he's saying, are you trying to tell me to stop uh, pursuing justice? Is that what you're saying now? Next slide, please. Okay, here's Julian on April 11th, 2019. Unceremoniously uh, dragged out of the Ecuadorian embassy in London in a very disheveled state. And that is a pure and simple why I decided on that day to look or try to look as disheveled as Julian. And so it's been, it's been uh, over two years and I think I've over fulfilled the norm actually. Uh, but as long as my wife tolerates it, uh, it'll come off when Julian is free. Uh, please God, that's one day soon. Can you tell why he looks that way? Well, you know, they deprived him of a razor blade and they wanted him to look uh, exactly the way he looked. Um, I imagine the rationale was he might commit suicide or something like that, but they hadn't done that before. 
Uh, they just wanted to prepare this uh, unruly fellow to look disheveled uh, and, uh, and they succeeded. Uh, let me say just a couple other things here. I was uh, hoping that uh, uh, John Shipton and Gabriel, his brother, uh, uh, would be around to hear this, but just to, you know, I look at my friend Julian as a classic, <laughs> okay? Uh, and if you, you think classic, you can go back to Socrates who said, there's no greater favor a man can have than to have the finest of sons. Well, I think uh, John Shipton got that twice. We're thinking mostly of Julian today. There is a, oh, John knows Greek. So let me uh, trade on my, uh, uh, on my uh, Homer here. This is the first couple of lines of the Odyssey. Andromoi elepamusa polutropan hos malapala. Okay. Uh, tell me, O oh muse, of a very re resourceful man who suffered so much. We had a lot, of, a lot of fun in high school and college studying classical Greek, and we learned all kinds of words. One was when, uh, when Odysseus came home from exile, uh, he met his old swineherd, Eumaeus, and his first, the first words out of his mouth as they looked over at the, at the big pile over here, he said, Yumai, Yumai he malathaman koon hadake tunikapro, which means, Eumaeus, surely this is a great wonder to see a dog such as this lying on the, on the dung pile. Okay. Now, the glory of that, of course, that we learned the, the word for dung. Uh, we learned the word for head. We knew that uh, kephale, you know, cephalic and so on. So we could go around calling our friends uh, kapras kephale and they wouldn't know what uh, we we're calling them, but uh, we would. We, uh, the honors, uh, honors classical students. That's an aside. The last thing I'll say is that Aeneas, the Aeneid, uh, he was distinguished by what they called, the adjective was pious, pious Aeneas. It wasn't pious. It wasn't pious at all. It was faithful. Faithful to his beliefs, faithful to his integrity, and faithful first and foremost to his father, Anchises, we carried around on his back. You ought to read the Aeneid if you haven't already done so. And to finish off, uh, so fast forwarding to modern times, uh, we have death of a salesman, and I'll, I'll finish on that because it applies so much to my friend Julian, and I think you'll understand why. I put it here so I wouldn't forget it. Forget it. Now, here it is. This comes out of the mouth of Willie Loman's wife, okay? Uh, she's feeling it for her, her, uh, her husband, uh, Willie. And she says this in Death of a Salesman. He's a human being and a terrible thing is happening to him. Think of Julian now. He's a human being and something terrible, a terrible thing is happening to him. So attention must be paid. He's not to be allowed to fall in his grave like an old dog. Attention, attention must be paid to such a person. End quote. Now, I know that Anne always has good ideas with respect to how in practical terms we can pay attention. And now's the time to pay attention. So I'll end here because we need a little time to do the Q&A and also to hear Anne's and others recommendations as to what we can do for Julian right now without further delay. Thanks for the floor, Anne. Mm. Thank you very so much. Um, I don't, Tom, I don't see any additional questions um, related to, uh, you know, that weren't just part of a, a thread. Um, are there, if, if anyone would like to ask questions of uh, John, Fidel, or Ray, 
Um, could you raise your hand or somehow indicate in the chat that you want to ask questions? And, and obviously we'll, we'll look for people who have not spoken yet. Um, <clears throat> what about the question about striking jurors for cause? Oh, I didn't see that. Okay, thank you, Tom. Yeah, um, can that's, you a, that's a good question. Um, and, and it was one of the first questions that I asked my attorneys. And they said that um, in previous cases, uh, striking jurors for cause in uh, national security cases had come up. But the fact that they had relatives working for national security organizations wasn't enough. It wasn't cause enough. And so that I would, I would largely have been stuck just like others before me had been stuck. Thank you. Thank you, that's a good question. I think I saw in the chat too, a question of what is Julian actually charged with? Would anyone like to address that? Why is he still in Belmarsh prison? Well, as I understand it, uh, the judge has refused extradition on grounds that he wouldn't survive U.S. prisons. How's that for an indictment of U.S. prisons? <laughs> and the U.S. Uh, Justice Department, so-called, uh, has appealed that. And the appeal is going to the High Court in London. Uh, months ago, it was said that it'll probably be in June now people are talking, well, maybe September. The name of the game here is to keep Julian confined, keep him moving around from court to court, from cell to cell, hoping maybe he'll catch COVID or just so that they can wash their hands of him. I'm sure, uh, I'm not sure, but I think probably everyone would be delighted on the British and the American official side if just Julian would go away and they will have made their point that if you criticize a government, if you show a government actively engaged in war crimes, this is what happens to you, all right? No, this is what gonna get you. You live in Antarctica, you live in Australia or, or Chile, I'm gonna get you, it doesn't matter. We're all around the world, we're the United States, we're exceptional people and we're gonna get you. And what a damper that has had already, already on the ability of people to report uh, misadventures or crimes of government. Uh, there have been lots of crimes of government that have not been exposed because, uh, well, it's too difficult to do. People like James Risen, you know, take him, for example. He used to have a lot of sources in the intelligence community. Why has he not had one story in the last five years? Why? <laughs> Why? I think the, the question answered itself. And what does he do instead? He criticizes us for conspiracy theories. He criticizes us for saying, hey, Russiagate was a farce. Trump is right about that one thing and one thing only. Uh, and so Ryzen falls in with the crowd that says, oh, McGovern and Vinny and those folks they're conspiracy theorists. Well, it's going to come out. It may come out at the summit that the real conspiracy was to keep the information down as to the, the uh, unseriousness or the, the hoax that had become Russiagate. And uh, just as an ancillary point there, if, uh, if President Biden goes in uh, with flaming arrows and saying, you better stop meddling. You better stop hacking like you did in 2016. Putin's going to say, oh, let me show you something, uh, President Biden. Here's the testimony of the head of CrowdStrike. He says there was no, there was no exfiltration of, of information from the DNC. What, what what, what, where's your evidence? <laughs> In other words, it's going to go into a buzzsaw. Buzz so uh, that's, the, that's the kind of thing that can come to light. But for the nonce, uh, Julian is suffering, and we should all suffer with him. That's, what's, that's what, what uh, sympathy means. 
and um, we you need to do action as well. And and Anne, I'm, I'm depending on you to give us some good suggestions. So thank you, Ray. Um, I think we do have one question from Mark Taylor, and uh, and then we'll go to those suggestions. Um, I'm looking for Mark Taylor to see if I can unmute him. Are There's a couple him? additional questions. Mark? Yeah, thank you. I was just wondering if somebody could give a quick <clears throat> outline or agenda of what happens next with Julian's trial and a rough timeline. What, what should we be expecting in the coming, coming weeks or months? The only thing that I, I know is what he said, and that is that uh, his brother, Gabriel, told me that they're hoping something will happen in the fall. Okay? Now that's just typical. Uh, there are no, nothing certain here. They just keep people hanging. Will the high court take it? Will the high court do it? So that's, that's, that or, that's where it stands. Now, someone else might know more. John, do you perhaps know or? Anyone else? Um, I know that on the uh, AssangeDefense.org uh, site, uh, there are there is information about what's going on, and it's just as you say. It's uh, there's no deadline, and and then there are options. You know, if if that's exhausted, then what happens? Um, remember, um, Pinochet, who was uh, wanted to be, uh, we wanted to extradite him. Um, he was kept in a villa, and, and uh, Julian is being kept uh, essentially isolated in a very COVID-infested prison. Hmm. So I'm, uh, if with that, if you don't mind, I'm going to, um, let me see if I can get to share my screen. Hmm. For some reason, I, I don't see... Um, let's see if I can get to share my, oh, there it is. Okay. I'm going to share my screen and I, I would like to talk about, um, some things that, uh, people can do, um, to help Julian. So I think the first order of business is to contact uh, general Merrick Garland and, um, he actually should be sympathetic. Uh, but so far has not been, but ask that the extradition request be dropped. Describe how silencing Julian will destroy national security journalism and your right to know and indicate that for democracy to work proper to, properly, citizens must know what their government is doing. And of course, Julian's releases have given us a panoramic view of wars that were in progress, the Afghan war logs and the Iraqi war logs and uh, in terms of revealing uh, 15,000 more citizens uh, killed than were actually documented, documenting other uh, abuses. So secondly, call the Justice Department comment line. The number is here. I'm gonna put all of this in the chat. Uh, call your US senators and representatives. And again, the number, this is a general number. Uh, attend an event during the Home Run for Julian tour. This is the website. Um, contribute to the tour. Nathan sent me last night uh, the, you know, the best places to contribute to the tour, to contribute to Julian's legal defense, and to sign a petition to free Julian. So this came from Nathan Fuller uh, of the Courage Foundation and Assange Defense. Uh, learn about the importance of WikiLeaks releases, and you can do that uh, at the Assange uh, Defense site. Learn more from testimony at the extradition hearing. I think this is really important given the blackout on news from the testimony and, and Assange Defense has organized this in a very nice way. Um, but you can, um, you can get lots of information there. Amy Goodman uh, interviewed John and Gabriel uh, just a few days ago, and that's a wonderful interview. Um, Join Assange Defense at assangedefense.org or write to Julian. Now, I have a different uh, address here than was given earlier uh, for writing to Julian, uh, but all of those are things that, that one can do. 
And I'm just going to copy that now and put it in the chat. And maybe one of you, uh, one of our panelists would like to add some words of your own. May I say one more thing? Sure. Um, you know, sometimes we, sometimes we think that that whatever little actions we could take are inconsequential, and um, you know, what? How far is twenty dollars going to go? Or what's Julian going to care if I send him a postcard? I can tell you, as someone who spent two years in a federal prison and responded to every one of the 7,000 letters and cards that I received, that those postcards and letters uh, can, can save a person. It can save Julian from a depression that is debilitating, crippling. Um, you know, $20 to, to spend on phone calls uh, can be a lifesaver. Uh, just a kind word uh, can be a lifesaver. There was a woman who I had never met in Ringgold, Georgia, who sent me a card on the very day that I arrived in prison. And all it was, was um, a, a picture of some roses in her garden and a few kind words. And I can't tell you what that meant to me. Now, Julian has been I, effectively, he's been in prison. Effectively, really, he's been in solitary confinement for 10 years. That's really what it comes down to. Uh, he, he doesn't get out to see roses or birds or blue skies. And so something that we may take for granted is just, you know, I, as I said, inconsequential, could save this poor guy. So if you think that, that your little action is really not a big enough deal to, to, to bother Julian with, you're wrong. He, I'm sure he's gonna be forever indebted for that kind word. Well, thank you, John. That's a wonderful note to go out on. And I want to thank Peace Action Wisconsin, who, um, and, and Tom Rodman from Peace Action Wisconsin, who's provided all of our technical support here. I want to thank Assange Defense, which is sponsoring uh, J Gabriel and John's tour of the United States. And, and I really want to thank John and Gabriel for joining us, uh, even though they're very busy in DC today. And I want to thank our wonderful, wonderful panelists, Ray McGovern, John Kiriakou, and the inevitable, the, <laughs> anyway, and Fidel, Fidel Narvez, it is so wonderful to finally meet you. And um, so, and, and John, I'm meeting John for the first time. So uh, thank you all. Thank Fantastic. you our audience. Thank you audience for being here and uh, for all of your wonderful questions.